Good evening, everyone. I think we can begin our program. <clears throat> I'm Jonathan Brent. I'm executive director of the EVO Institute for Jewish Research, and it's a great pleasure, as always, uh, to welcome the, uh, the family of Naomi Prower Kadar, uh, members of the, uh, of the Naomi Foundation, uh, and all of you this evening. Uh, to, I believe it's the fifth annual Kadar Lecture on the subject of Yiddish language and linguistics. What subject could be closer to the center of Evo's interests, to the heart of what it is that the Evo Institute is all about? And so this lecture series is a key and significant element in the way that the Evo Institute is helping not only to retain the highest standards of scholarship in the field of Yiddish studies, but also to project its message to its community. <clears throat> and so we thank the Kadar family and the Kadar Foundation very, very much for making this possible. In keeping with this, um, this element in our world, the Yiddish element, I want to mention one thing that I think uh, might be of interest to many of you who are here, because I'm sure that it would have been of interest uh, to Naomi, which is the project now underway by the Evo Institute to preserve and digitize its entire pre-war collection <coughs> of Yiddish literature and Yiddish publications and all of the documents that were saved uh, from the destruction of the Holocaust, saved partly in New York and partly in Vilnius. Those of you who are interested in learning more about this project there are brochures on the table outside. We are looking for people to volunteer, people who know Yiddish, people who can read 18th century Yiddish handwriting, uh, people who know the difference between one dialect and another dialect and yet a third dialect and a fourth dialect. Uh, anyone who is interested in these uh, arcane matters that are important to all of us, uh, please do see me or a member of the EVO staff or be in touch with us by email. Um, we are truly delighted at the fact that members of the Kadar family are here, but we also wish to acknowledge that Avraham and uh, Nadav and Enat are not uh, with us this evening. They are in Israel because of personal commitments uh, and uh, cannot attend tonight's program. The Kadar Foundation um, is an extension uh, is an extension of Naomi's life's work, and the. Naomi Prower Kadar Foundation is dedicated to reimagining education. Its goal is to empower educators and promote leadership in education in order to inspire and nurture the next generation. Through entrepreneurial and established channels and together with the foundation's partners and grantees, the Naomi Foundation drives in innovation to create meaningful and lasting impact the Naomi Foundation champions Yiddish, Naomi's lifelong passion as a vibrant, rich, and contemporary language. It advances the teaching and learning of Yiddish, particularly in academic and scholarly settings. Before I introduce uh, Maya Kadar Kowalski, who will say a few words and introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to say that if you support Evo's mission, our work, 
the saving of Yiddish culture, and with that, I would say, the continuity and the preservation of Jewish culture generally. You might consider visiting the Yivo table outside, becoming a Yivo member. We rely on you. Uh, we rely on the support of those who love this subject, who love this world. Uh, please see us after the program. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Maya. Maya is the eldest daughter of Naomi Prower Kadar, and together with her family, helped co-found the Naomi Foundation to honor her mother's memory. As, a, as one of the vice presidents on the board of directors of the Naomi Foundation, she provides insight into Na Naomi's perspective and professional skills, supports the team in critical decision making, and provides media pr uh, production expertise. As a senior vice president of BrainPop, Maya's responsibilities include overseeing BrainPop ESL, a digital English as a second language resource, and Yiddish Pop an online Yiddish language and learning platform. Before coming to Brain Pop, Maya worked for two prominent Israeli film and television companies, JS, a JCS Post Production and Spike Communications. Maya received her MFA in film production from Tel Aviv University in Israel. She received her BA from Barnard College of Columbia University in Film Studies and Art, History, and Visual Art. Maya? Thank you, Jonathan, for your kind words and everything, um, and for everything that you and the team here at YIVO did to make this evening a success. I especially want to thank Helena Gindi, Suzanne Leone, and David Haskell for their efforts. Uh, thank you also to Lindsay Blank Bodner of the Naomi Foundation for her, for her part in organizing, and also thank you to my family members who could attend. Um, and are in the audience, uh, including my aunt Renee Goller, who is Naomi's sister. Um, and of course, thank you all for coming and uh, coming together um, and joining us this evening. It's always very uplifting for me to see a group of people come together to celebrate a historical, vibrant, and transformative nature of Yiddish. So. With the annual Naomi Prower Kadar Memorial Lecture tonight, we hope to provide an opportunity for the public to explore topics in Yiddish language and linguistics and the history of Yiddish. My mother, Naomi Prower Kadar, Zichrona Lebracha, believed deeply in the transformative power of Yiddish language and saw the way Yiddish inspired her students to connect with their heritage. This annual lecture, very appropriately, honors her as a scholar and educator. Naomi spent her life celebrating Yiddish. The daughter of survivors, she grew up speaking Yiddish in her home in the Bronx, and she and her siblings attended Sholem Aleichem Folkschule 45. In Naomi's eyes, however, you did not need to grow up speaking Yiddish in order to learn and appreciate all of the art, history, humor, and tradition the language has to offer. Naomi taught Yiddish to students all over the world for over 25 years, and she took so much joy in helping her students uncover the linguistic beauty and cultural richness of Yiddish. She later became a scholar of Yiddish and received her doctorate from Columbia University, where under Professor David Ruskies, also in attendance tonight, um, she completed her dissertation on Yiddish children's magazines in the United States from 1917 through 1950. When my mother passed away in um, 2009, my father, Dr. Kadar, Dr. Avram Kadar, my brother, Nadav, my sister, Einat, and I started the Naomi Foundation to further Naomi's passion and energy in the fields of innovation in education, scientific and medical research, and Yiddish in scholarly settings, in academic and scholarly settings. One of our goals as a foundation is to make Yiddish scholarship accessible to a wider audience. And to that end, we are very fortunate 
to have Dr. Jeffrey Chandler, a tremendous Yiddish scholar, great speaker, and family friend with us tonight. Jeffrey is a scholar of modern and contemporary Jewish culture, professor and chair of the Department of Jewish Studies at Rutgers University, as well as the current president of the Association for Jewish Studies. He has a long history with YIVO. Jeffrey was a student in the Uriel Weinreich Summer Program, a graduate fellow of the Max Weinreich Center, and also a YIVO staff member. Jeffrey has authored numerous books and publications during his laudable career. His most recent book, Shtetl, a vernacular intellectual history, examines how Jewish life in East European provincial towns has become the subject of extensive creativity, memory, and scholarship from the early modern era to the present. Jeffrey, I thank you so much for being here tonight. We're all looking forward to your lecture entitled, and now I have to read in Jewish something, Yiddish performances by Holocaust survivors. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Chandler. Thank you very much, Maya, and I want to thank everyone for coming on this dark and stormy night. Uh, I am uh, very grateful to the Naomi Foundation for making this evening possible, and I'd like to thank uh, as well the staff of YIVO for organizing tonight's lecture. Uh, I'm especially grateful to Chava Lappin and uh, Eddie Portnoy for their assistance in pre preparing my presentation. I'd also like to express my thanks to the USC Shoah Foundation for uh, their encouragement and support of the research uh, that I'll be sharing with you tonight, uh, with special thanks to Karen Jungblut, who is the Shoah Foundation's Director of Research, who made it possible for me to show you excerpts from the Foundation's interviews. And I am, I am deeply, deeply honored to be invited to give this talk in memory of Nomi Kadar. I, I met her in the 1980s, when uh, very early in my days of studying Yiddish at YIVO and at Columbia, and very quickly she became one of my most treasured colleagues. Her commitment to Yiddish culture, her thoughtfulness, her expertise as a teacher were so inspiring to me then, and they continue to inspire me to this day. And I can think of no finer way of honoring her memory than the work of the foundation that bears her name. It's a very special legacy, and may it continue to inspire many, many more people. So my talk tonight uh, comes from research uh, in an archive that's very fitting for a building that is chock full of archival collections. And as users of collections here in the Center for Jewish History can attest, the measure of an archive's worth lies in the ability of researchers to make discoveries within its holdings above and beyond whatever the archive's creators envisioned when they established it. And the same holds true for the Shoah Foundation's Visual History Archive, which is the largest collection of videotaped interviews with survivors and other witnesses to the Holocaust. This collection, which was inaugurated in 1994, includes over 51,000 interviews. They were recorded in 56 countries and in 32 languages, most of them over a period of about five years. The creators of this archive envisioned it primarily as a resource for historians of the Holocaust, as a memorial to its victims, and as a resource for combating intolerance in the future. But, as is true of any other archive, researchers, myself included, want to see what else can be found within its holdings, what else can be learned from them. So when I was first introduced to the Visual History Archive in the year 2010, I noted that among its holdings were over 600 interviews conducted either fully or partly in Yiddish. That makes the Visual History Archive one of the most extensive collections of recordings of native Yiddish speakers born in Europe before World War II. So as a scholar of Yiddish, I was curious to find out what these recordings had to offer. I started to listen to them. And they proved to be richly revealing on several counts. For example, among these recordings, there are dozens in which survivors switch between Yiddish and another language. It might be English, Russian, Hebrew, some other language. This is what linguists call code switching. 
And this business of code switching actually breaks with the archives protocols of conducting interviews in a single language, which of course is typical for doing oral histories. When the foundation was contacted by a, a, a Holocaust survivor and they wanted to set up an interview, they said, well, what language do you want to be interviewed in? And they would get an appropriate interviewer. Nevertheless, it's not surprising that this code switching happens frequently uh, as most Jewish Holocaust survivors use more than one language over the course of their lives. Uh, the ways that survivors switch into and out of Yiddish in, in these interviews uh, varies con considerably, but they all demonstrate the challenge of relating a personal history in one's own words when speaking two or more languages, not only as part of someone's life experience, but it is also characteristic of that person's Jewishness. As the literary critic Shmuel Nigger once observed, uh, one language has never been enough for the Jewish people. Other interviews offer information about the place uh, of Yiddish in Jewish life before, uh, during, or after the war. So some survivors recall the riches of modern Yiddish culture in pre-war Europe. Others describe drastically different engagements with the language during the upheavals of World War II. These range from the need to pretend not to understand Yiddish, lest it reveal their identity as Jews, to the use of Yiddish as essential to their survival. With regard to the post-war years, some survivors talk about reconnecting with the language after years of not speaking it or hearing it, and especially connecting with other speakers from their native regions as an emotionally powerful experience. What I found particularly compelling among these recordings are several dozen instances in which survivors perform in Yiddish at some point during their interviews. They sing a song, recite a poem, maybe read an essay. Some survivors present works of their own creation, others perform compositions by another author or composer. In some of these videos, only the performance is in Yiddish, the rest of the interview is conducted in another language, uh, and uh, in other cases, the entire recording is in Yiddish. But in all of these performances, we can see how survivors imbue Yiddish with a special significance, a significance that redounds onto the value they place on recording their life histories as works of remembrance and as a legacy for future generations. We'll consider one such performance, which takes place near the end of the interview with Doba Apolovich. This was recorded in Melbourne, Australia in 1997. At the start of this excerpt, the interviewer, Jason Walker, who is off camera, uh, asks uh, uh, Apolovich what she is about to read. So if we could switch over to the videos, please. Okay. And um, the, you will see there are subtitles uh, on the, uh, 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 on the, the uh, videos that I'm going to show you. But in case you can't see them, we've also provided you with translations of the texts. Okay. Oh, I have to get back in. Goodness, it fell asleep. All right, here we go. Could you read me something? That is a poem I wrote in Melbourne in April 1965. I wrote it for a magazine, a magazine, Havasha. I wrote it then and I almost forgot about it. And the poem is about Gordele. I mentioned before Gordele in Birkenau, but she commits suicide. You will have to forgive me if you don't understand it, but I want it to be in my testimony included a Yiddish poem by Nacht. Von Neppel und vom Stäuber, der Reus gewickelt sich die Nacht. A Tempel schweigen und die Pustkeit eingeschleiert. Auf der Nahe dort versunken ist Surin, ist Gruf und in die Schamme eingeklemmt, vermeuert. Stehen Blocken wie Soldaten in der Schule und sie glotzen. Und herum is the Natur verbrennt, a Säu verschnitten. Die Drotten von Elektra, auf die Pleuten glieh Meure. 
nicht einmal wirst du ein Leben auf dem Tät verbieten. Die Drotten werden besser, wie die Kinder noch geguckt. Der Schäumer hielt, ewig soll der Pein sich ziehen. Heint, wacht Goldele der Mannes in Großfieber, verschmachte Lippen und die Augen ihre Triebe glühen. Sie kennt nicht mehr, als sofort sie zu sich allein getragen. Sie will nicht noch am Morgen so für ihr Ruf scheinen. Gegangen wird hat sie sich auf alle vier Reus beinahe. Sie will schon kein Mal mehr nicht lachen und nicht weinen. Gegliefert hin früh Morgen. Spannen machen es resignierte. Noch goldene. Befreit ist nicht mehr zwischen sie. Eine Gestalt hängt auf die Drotten durchgelächert. Nicht gekennt und goldene, vertrocken mehr dem Weh. So, as uh uh, Apolovich explains her poem, pays homage to the memory of a young woman named Goldila, a victim of Nazi persecution, whom Apolovich knew during the war and whose suicide clearly haunted her long afterward. Many other survivors relate similar stories in these videos, recalling the tragic fates of, of family members or other acquaintances that they witnessed. But Apolovich's recollection is distinguished by being offered in the form of a poem. Doing so links her commitment to honoring the memory of a friend with a demonstration of her own creativity as a way of responding to her grief. Before reading her poem, we heard uh, Apolovich assert, with apologies, that she wants a Yiddish poem included in the recording. Earlier in the interview, uh, she is asked about her activity in Melbourne's Jewish community, and she speaks passionately about her commitment to Yiddish culture. You have no idea how much I love that language, she says. I did everything to promote Yiddish here in Melbourne. I worked in Yiddish. I taught Yiddish. She also disparages other survivors whom she knows who abandoned the language. And yet, like many other survivors, Apolovich chose to be interviewed in English. In fact, about half of the archive's interviews with Jewish Holocaust survivors are in English. It's very likely that she made this choice so that her life story would be most widely and readily understood by future listeners in Australia and elsewhere. At the same time, she felt it essential to have a record of her commitment to Yiddish not only described, but also demonstrated in the language. There are other survivors who, like Apolovich, are published authors, and they read aloud their writings from books or, or periodicals. Others recite unpublished works from memory or from manuscripts. Among these survivors is Abraham Bamba. Uh, he may be familiar, familiar to you as one of the Holocaust survivors who was interviewed in Claude Lanzmann's 1985 documentary, Shoah. In one of the most memorable sequences of this eight and a half hour long film, Bamba is uh, filmed cutting someone's hair in a barber shop as he answers Lanzmann's questions about having been a barber while a prisoner in Treblinka, cutting off the hair of women prisoners who were about to be put to death. Bamba was interviewed for the Visual History Archive by Louise Bobrow in Monticello, New York in 1996. At the end of the interview, which is conducted in English, he reads two poems that he wrote during the war and which, as you will hear, he insists, must be read in Yiddish. We'll just hear the first one. Is there anything else you would like to say at this point? No, I think I said already enough. Oh, you want to have this thing here? But I will not sound, even my translation or any other translation, is not the same as a poem is set in the original. What is, what, can you tell me about this poem? What are you going to read now? Now, this is a poem 
about taking, how I would say in English, in a coma. How could you say? When did you write this poem? In the ghetto. In Chastakova? Yeah. I got two of them. That is, I would say, take advantage of the, of the thing what you went through, where you were sent, and there will, come, there will come a time when you take, not exactly adventure, but you will fight against them. You will hate them, and you will live the time when you will be liberated. It's a very, it's, I would say it is very nice. I got two of them. And you wrote this yourself? Yes. And this no. was your original poem? Yes. And, and in what language are you going to read it first? The own Jewish. So you're going to read it in Yiddish? Oh, in Yiddish. That's all in Yiddish. In, in, in English, I don't write. In anything else, I didn't write. Only those two. So you will read the those first poem now in Yiddish. No. The poem goes like that. It's called Nekoma. It says, Ich will euch die Geschichte erzählen, Geseide. Hotsch wusstest du, es ist Aktio, bist du ein jeder. Treblinka, o Schwänchen, farjidische Griebe. Ein hat mir geschickt, unsere Schwestern und Brüder. In euch wollt ihr wissen, wo es dort ist verlaufen. Da fragt schon die Menschen, wo es ihnen entlaufen. Es muss doch verbleiben, auf Nacht im Milchummer. Gedenkt schon, Brüder, jetzt in einem Milchummer. You don't understand nothing. Is that what you translated before, what you yes, said before? Yeah, yeah. Is that what that meant? Ja. Yeah. Sei, es trefft schon einer, er probiert es anzuläufen. Er geht sie die Drohten in Willem überkäufen. Geld spielt keine Rolle, er hat es genick. Er geht sie die Drohten mit langsamem Tritt. Nach Plitzinger Schoss, es fährt im Fenster vor den Augen. Er liegt schon von Schmerzen zusammengezogen. Du so ein schuldige Blut schreit und es rieft, ne komme, ne komme, gedenkt und dem geht. Jetzt wollen wir einen Hassack in Holz und Heiße, sei es in unsere Bekleide, in unsere Bespeise. Amerika eilt sich nicht, England hat Zeit, die Russen sei geil, aber sie nennen noch weit. Und wieder ein Nacht zu, inmitten der Nacht, Finne findet Korbunis offenbar zu Eulem gebracht. Vor der Welt sung sei, es sei vier Milchummen, nur Kimme wird die Zeit für Nehmen kommen. Okay. Now, uh, Bamba's uh, full interview for the Visual History Archive enables him to offer a much more extensive account of his wartime experience than he is afforded in his appearance in Lanzmann's Shoah, including uh, his participation in acts of Jewish resistance in Treblinka. The sequence in the Visual History Archive recording when Bamba reads his poems epitomizes the difference between these two interviews, the one for the documentary and then the one for the archive. In Shoah, Director Lanzmann is very clearly in charge. But in the Visual History Archive, when Bamba and other survivors perform a poem or a song, they take charge of the interview. Rather than responding to interviewers' questions, survivors are proactive in these moments. In effect, they're directing the video through their performance. Indeed, during these sequences, the video ceased to, be, to present interviews per se, which by their nature are dialogues. Instead, when survivors perform on these recordings, uh, they temporarily become vehicles for monologues. As we've seen in these two performances, part of survivors taking charge of the recording also entails a shift to Yiddish, their preferred language for creative self-expression. In English, I don't write, Bamba explains. Similarly, another survivor, Emil Goldbarton, comments, I write only Jewish poetry, and he means Yiddish poetry. And before reading her poem, Sophia Elbaum announces, and now I have to read in Jewish something. For some interviewers, 
and some future viewers of the video who know no Yiddish, these moments can exclude them from the possibility of engaging with the semantic content of the survivor's performances, though the affect can be very powerful to watch and to hear. And so some survivors, like Bamba, offer brief explanations of the text that they read, either before or after, but others don't. The translations that uh, uh, you have either on the screen or in the handout tonight are, I've provided you especially for this presentation uh, tonight. Now note also that the interviewer asks Bamba to describe not only the content of his poems, but also the context of their creation. And he explains that both were written when he was in the ghetto in Shenstachova in 1942. Similarly, when another survivor, Rivka Braun, reads a poem from her book, Lieder von Pein, Poems of Pain, which was published in Paris in 1957, the interviewer asks her when the poem was written. And she replies that she wrote it during the war while she was hiding in a bunker. The interviewer asked how she got materials to write, and Brown explains that a man who provided her with bread when she was in hiding also brought her a pen and paper. And from such accounts, we learn about the vital role that doing something creative, composing a poem, or singing a song played in some survivors' responses to the Holocaust, both during the war and in the years following. Now, most survivors recite poems or sing songs only once during their interviews, and it's usually towards the end of the video, which places these performances apart from the chronology of their, their life history. But occasionally, survivors sing a song or recite a poem in the course of relating their personal histories. For example, when performing figures and accounts of staying alive during the Holocaust. In the next excerpt, Cecilia Einhorn, who was interviewed in San Francisco in 1999, recalls singing for fellow prisoners in Auschwitz. The interviewer, Zipporah Glass, asks Einhorn if she remembers any of these songs, and she responds by performing one of them. The song she sings, Chavalea Gut Shabbos, is from Moshe Richter's operetta, Reb Herzl Meyuches, which was composed sometime at the turn of the 20th century. And as you will hear, the song recounts the ordeals of preparing an elaborate Friday night meal to usher in the Sabbath. And I want to ask you, you know, you said that you were singing and you were singing. They allowed you to sing there? Nobody oh, yes, stopped you. yes. Matter of fact, sometimes they came, uh, sometimes there, then we are singing, so we stopped, you know. He, he comes to German there, uh, what will you do? But he said, no, no, sing. You can sing. Yeah. And what, what songs were you singing then? Uh, mostly the Jewish songs, which uh, my, uh, uh, from, from there, because m most of the girls didn't, know much even when I talk to them, you know, mostly only Jewish. So that's, that was the main thing. And anyway, we were, what were we sing? Some of his songs, mostly of it, they want now, let's sing that, let's sing that, let's sing that. Do you remember one of the songs that you Yes, sang? I do. I remember one song. Uh, Could you sing it? From something about how is it when you are when it's Friday and the, how you prepare for Friday night, what you eat and and how is everything there, and I hope that I will remember. I don't know. So they so it <coughs> I sang like that. The Friday kotuk is a surya kluk du zweiste chayede. A chat in a royer, man arbet mit koyer, de kopoi gewalt, geit of rede, halves backen fish, bulwe die machen, kochen, kneiten, baugen, lokschen, kochen, in a zimis, mismen huben, in die zie, bulwe schuben, nicht vergessen, die auch hubschaumen, in the sea, zimmers blomen, koilitsch flechten, mis geruten, kerbolfleisch, mis sage bruten, in eus arves, mis men sieden, alte menig, bei in sieden. Aber doch, 
meine Lieben, darf ich euch nicht sorgen, bald noch dem Kigale morgen. Du Skepp gezwungen, nicht du, du Skleid mit Schrabes, ihr kennt mir alle Summen, habe Laie Gütschabes. And they loved it. They loved it and they get a little bit smile and remember what it was. And that's how we live, to, to remember that and remember the other song. Mostly just Jewish because I said, all of it, and I didn't feel even like singing something else. And that, that's what we went through. That, that was something what I could see somebody smile. So in this segment, we see, it's really quite striking that in the midst of recalling the ordeals of being a prisoner in Auschwitz, that Einhorn's demeanor is completely transformed when she sings. And it's as if she not only remembers the song, but also the significance of its performance during the war. Her remembrance of the value that singing has in this context recalls the words of survivor Charlotte Delbo, who wrote in her memoir, Days in Memory, when I would recite a poem in Auschwitz, it was to keep myself alive, to preserve my memory, to remain me. For Einhorn, singing was a life-affirming act, not only for herself, but something that she could share with fellow prisoners. Now, occasionally, a survivor performed several times during the course of an interview. Bronislava Rabinovitz, who was interviewed in Petach Tikva in 1996, recalls, uh, recites from memory three Yiddish poems in the course of answering questions about her life experiences including her involvement in Jewish political youth movements before the war and her experience hiding from the Germans during the war. When Rabinovitz offers post-war reflections at the conclusion of her interview, she recites the last of these poems, all of which are her own compositions. This final poem takes the form of a letter addressed to God, demanding an accounting for the Holocaust. Mein lieber Gott, ich will zu dir schreiben einen Brief. Deine Adresse in Ergens nicht verschrieben. Aber ich glaube, du gefühlst dich um mich um. Lieber Vater im Himmel, ich will dich fragen, für was verwendest du dein Volk versöhnt? Wir haben doch angenommen, die heilige Tiere, was uns geschickt mit Moshe Rabbeinu. Deine zehn Geboten hitten wir doch. Wir sind gegen Morden, Brennen, Schächten. Hast du doch lieb, denn unser Welt der Volk ist heuer. Jetzt schon haben wir sich mit etwas versöhnt und gestreuchelt geworden. Ich weiß, wir sind doch nur reden, nicht gemalochen. Es steht doch befehlig, gerach im Oberwohnen. Wo ist gewinnt der Rachmanis? Aus den Gehörden geschrien, Himmel und Homs hat er gespalten, wem hat gebrennt, was ich von Teire, gute Fromme jeden. Junge Bachungen, welche seine Gesessen bis halbe Nacht und gelernt ein heilige Tiere. Bis doch heil, kann nun wie Rach, und wo ist gewinnt der Rachmanis? Kinder lachen, welche seine Gelegen bei der Mamis Brust, welche seine Nomschum sind. Vergib mir Gott. Was sieht dein Dienst mir nicht, wer dein Name zu der Mone? Ich und noch Tage Tausender zu mir will nach Schube. Die Korbone sind gefallen mit den letzten Ausgeschreien in die Grieber, schmeiß Reuel an die Schemmel hin und an die Schemmel hot. Ich schreibe auf Jiddisch, weil ich bin ein Jiddisch Kind, schreibe ich zu meinem Jiddischen Gott Tage noch auf Jiddisch. Wir gewiss verstehen, was ich will und was ich meine. Entschuldigt mir, lieber Vater im Himmel, was ich vernehme dir die Zeit, mit meinem Sippur. In this poem's last lines, uh, uh, Rabinovitz explains her choice of language as, as tautological, because it's uh, expressed in her use of the word Yiddish to mean both Jewish and Yiddish. Ich schreibe auf Yiddish, weil ich bin ein Yiddish Kind, schreibe ich zu meinem Yiddischen Gott, takenor auf Yiddish. I write in Yiddish because I'm a Jew, so I write to my Jewish God only in Yiddish. You know, it sort of comes apart in English, but in, in Yiddish, everything is tied together. Uh, for Rabinovitz, the Yiddish language is bound up with her Jewishness and her relationship with God, whom she addresses with an emotionally charged urgency and also ultimately with reverence. This same complex relationship with God informs Cantor Michael Deutsch's rendering of the song Adin Teure mit Gott at the end of his interview. The lyrics are by Levi Yitzhak of Berdichev, an important rabbi in the early history of Hasidism in the late 18th and early 19th century. In this song, Levi Yitzhak both calls God to account for Jewish suffering and voices his devotion to God. 
Deutsch, who was interviewed in Sydney in 1995, prefaces his performance by reflecting on the range of Jewish theological responses to the Holocaust. And he does this uh, in order to situate his own response through a personal connection to this song, which he sings as if he were Levi Yitzhak. But on the other hand, you know, as I said, some, 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 some Jews are angry and some Jews didn't believe and some Jews said, you know, that, you know, God, God is, not, is not right. So, but I, because we can argue with God. And this song, which I'm going to sing to you, is actually, I just, I just say very quickly at the beginning, it says, Good morning to you, God. I, Levi Yitzhak Ben Sora, which means I, Michael Deutsch, came to you with an argument for the people of Israel. What have you got against your people, Israel? Why did you sit on the people of Israel? As a matter of fact, as a command to the children of Israel, and as a look, as a look is saying to the children of Israel, and as one word, as like speaking to the children of Israel, this is just as, but it says, Father, Father, look how many nations are in the world, and etc., etc. This is this is the song. Good morning to the boy in the Shalom. Ich lebe Yitzchak ben Sore, mi bardi hichev. Bin gekommen zu dir, mit a den Teure von der Volk Israel. Wo's hast du zu dein Volk Israel? And wo's hast du dich umgesetzt an der Volk Israel? As von Horazach, ich sah es ben Israel. As von Horakuk, is a more than Israel. As von Horavor is a daber than Israel. Taten you, taten you, come a mod boy lam. Parashayim, Babalayim, Adonayim. The Englander was again. Azeir Malchus is a Malchus. The Italianer was again. Azeir King is a King. Un ich lebe Yitzchak ben Sore mit Ardi Hitchevesog. Hamelech. Hayoeshev. Al kiseram veniso. Un ich lebe Yitzchak ben Sore. Mi war die Hitsche besog, leil ich mim koi mit, ich bin von Ort nicht da weggehen, und ein Eck soll schon sein, und ein Sob soll schon kommen, o jede Gadal, de jedes Kadasch, schäme Rabo. the song. Survivors' performances demonstrate how these videos are, in a sense, like time capsules. And in fact, survivors are regularly asked near the end of these interviews if they have a message for the future. Some of them decide that such a message is best delivered through expressive works. For Holocaust survivors, the opportunity to display something creative in the face of genocide as part of interviews centering on recalling widespread destruction has a special significance. These recitals serve as reminders of the survivors' tenacity both during the Holocaust and for half a century after the end of the war. Performing in Yiddish animates not only the survivors but also the language and all that it has come to represent a half century after the Holocaust. By using a language so closely identified with a culture and a people decimated during the war, survivors affirm the endurance of a collective Yiddishkeit, as well as their own survival in the face of genocide. Given the centrality of the Holocaust in these interviews, and that, of course, is the reason for their being recorded, this assertion can be seen as an act of defiance. Through these Yiddish reciters, recitals, survivors implicitly insist 
that their lives be documented and be heard not only in the context of destruction and loss, but also in terms of Jewish cultural persistence and creativity as they experienced it in their first language. We're going to watch and listen to one more performance by Meyer Abramovich, who was interviewed for the uh, Visual History Archive in Montreal in 1997. Abramovich ends his interview by displaying a painting that he made inspired by the well-known Yiddish song, Affenweg Shteta Boim. The lyrics uh, written in Warsaw in the 1930s are by the poet Itzik Manga. Uh, at interviewer Chava Respitz's suggestion, Abramovich, who is off camera, sings the song as the camera records his picture. So here a survivor's display of creativity and devotion to Yiddish culture is twofold, expressed both musically and visually. It is the conclusion of his interview, and I'll conclude my presentation with this as well. Das ist ein Bild, was ihr gemalt. Erzählt uns wegen Bild, ich kann hier uns erzählen yeah. wegen Bild und singen wegen dem. Ja. Yeah. Also, mit dem Bild habe ich ein bisschen bei dem Das ist ein Bild gemacht, ein Bild, ich habe es allein gemalt. Und die Idee die für das Bild ist von, die, von dem Song, von dem Gesang, was heißt, auf dem Weg steht der Boy. Und sie, sie verlangen, ich soll, ich soll singen ein bisschen den Song, weil ich auf dem Weg steht der Boy, steht der ein Gebäude. Alle Vögel von den Bäumen sehnen sich zu Freuden. Wer kein Misach, wer kein Meire, und der Rest kein Dorn. Und den Bäumen gelost allein, hefka Faden stören. Sag ich zu der Mama her, so ist der noch mit Stern. Wenn ich Mama zum Zweck bald auf Vögel werden. Ich will sitzen auf dem Boim und will ihm verwiegen. Über Winter mit der Dreis und mit der Scheine mit Miegen. Tam, tiddle, liddle, 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 Sagt die Mama, mit sie kreuen und sie weint mit Tränen. Kennst du Lille auf dem Boim, mir verfroren werden. Sag ich, Mama, es ist ein Schott, deine schöne Augen. Eder Wurst und Eder Wern, bin ich mir auf Feugel. Sag die Mama, jetzt sie kreuen, sehr um Gottes Willen. Nimm sich mit der Schale, so sich nicht verkehren. Die Kaloschen zu sich holen, es geht das schwer Winter. Und die Kutschmetten sich und weiß mir und windig. Dann die Lili, die der Damm. Und den Winter leibel nehm, du sich und du scheute. Euer Gewürz mir sein kein Gas zwischen alle Teute. Guck ich traurig mir rein, nimm mein Mannes Schweigen. Schaut ihr Liebe nicht gelost, wer mir auf Feugel. Auf dem Weg steht der Bäum, steht ein Gebäude. Alle Feugel von dem Bäum sind an sich zu freuen. Alle Feugel von dem Bäum sind an sich zu freuen. Ich stehe in einem Dank. Thank you very much. So I believe we have some time for questions. And um, there's our microphone. And if you raise your hand, we'll, uh, we'll take your question. Right. 
Okay, so I'll just repeat the question in case you didn't hear it. Uh, how, ma how many uh, films did I look at? Um, uh, I looked at every one of the Yiddish performances. Uh, I don't remember how many there are. I think maybe about 50, I don't know. Some of them are very short, uh, especially ones that come up in the course of um, a recollection. It's like, you know, two lines of a song and they're done. So like one guy, is very sweet. He's talking about before the war and he's a, he's a teenager and he's getting interested in girls and he doesn't know how to talk to them. And he then sings this, uh, this song, Choba uh, Mabela, is he fine? Ich will tanzen, sie will nein. I have a girl and she's, she's nice and I want to go dancing, but she doesn't. And that's it, you know? It just did that and it like, just like popped into his head. And so there are moments like, like that that are, 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 are quite, uh, quite lovely. And um, uh, so what, uh, th and there's, there's a considerable range beyond what I've been able to show you today. Partly what I wanted to show you complete performances because I think it's just, since I'm already showing you excerpts, it'll at least have some kind of integrity to it and give you some sense of uh, a range of speakers of Yiddish, of um, uh, motives, of kinds of texts that they perform, uh, it, but uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's just a sample. It's, um, and it, it, it's, it's quite, quite interesting. I would say that um, to me, you know, when I, I made this, this discovery that they have all these interviews in Yiddish, I mean, I didn't discover it, they knew, of course, that they had these interviews, I said, wow, this is an incredible resource for students of Yiddish. And then I said, you want to do something about that? And they said, yeah, that's a nice idea. But it wasn't, it's not necessarily, um, uh, I think it's something that they're waiting for somebody else to come in and do because, you know, their focus is, is different, but it's, it's part of what, this is what's great about poking around in any archive is you find stuff that's in there that um, even the people who put it in there never really thought of as having the value you find in it. And I think it's, uh, it's a resource uh, in its full waiting to be tapped. I certainly haven't looked at all 600 plus interviews, and uh, though I would like to. So, strikes me as a, a wasted opportunity. That is, if we have these 600 uh, uh, interviews, um, if they had been briefed by Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, they might have asked some other questions about, you know, the social context of these songs. And we might have learned something that we'll never know, which is who sang these songs to whom, where did you hear it? So we have Cecilia Einhorn, and that was, that's wonderful. She, you know, she gives you, she tells you who, when we sang and, and the, and uh, she dramatizes how the German comes in and says, no, no, you can sing. Um, but in every case, that should have been the first question. Um, but the way these interviews are conducted, it's me, myself, my experience, the survivor, the individual, and again the individual, and again the individual. Um, so I, you know, this makes me very sad because uh, we'll never have this opportunity again. Um, and uh, incidentally, a Abraham Bamba couldn't have written uh, this uh, song, this poem, in 1942 because he knows all about Auschwitz and, and the camps in Treblinka. He knows about the Holocaust. He knows the compass. He couldn't have known that in 1942. I don't know when he wrote it. He's, it seems to be still written during the war because the British haven't, you know, the, 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 the Russians haven't liberated us yet. And so maybe he wrote it in 1945, who knows? But certainly uh, one needed to be much more critical. But okay, it is what it is and we're grateful for what we have. You know, you, you raise good points and I would say that, um, you know, the interviewing really varies in terms of what interviewers decide, sometimes on the spot, to ask. Uh, the, the performances are, in most cases, not something they know is going to happen in advance of the interview. And the idea that, you know, to, how to ask questions about it, I don't know was something they were particularly, you know, trained in doing. However, 
you can pick stuff up if you poke around elsewhere in the interview. So one of the things that's interesting about Cecilia Einhardt, since you mentioned her, is earlier in the interview, she talked about in the pre her pre-war life, and she said that uh, in her family, she and her brothers and sisters, their favorite thing to do was to sing songs. They had this wide repertoire. They performed for their family. They performed for their friends. Um, and that it, at home, they mostly spoke and probably mostly sung in Polish. However, they learned some Yiddish songs because w their grandparents, they spoke to in Yiddish, and those were the songs they liked. So um, with that information from the earlier part, actually enriches what you hear her in the section that I played for you where she says, well, I mostly do the Jewish songs because that's, that's the only language that we had in common. Um, and that's what people wanted. So um, in some cases you can, by working through the interview, uh, get a sense of context and then sometimes, sometimes you don't. And to a certain extent, you're right, it is up to the survivors. And um, in general, I would say there's a reluctance to question survivors. And in fact, I think part of the way uh, interviewers were trained was you don't argue with the survivors. If he says 1942, you don't say, really, 1942? Are you sure? Uh, because, um, you know, I think partly of their understanding of the social contract of these interviews. Um, and, um, uh, I, I think also, I mean, in general, with things like asking about dates during the war and when people wrote things, it's not like they have calendars, you know, uh, in, in, where they can, you know, document in diaries where they can write things down in most cases. So, you know, pushing people on, on dates might, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't hold that much by it uh, in, in any case. But, you know, it is, it is one of the challenges of, of working uh, with this material, and um, I, I have to say personally, I find myself going back and forth between the frustrations that you've expected, uh, expressed, and then trying to figure out, you know, how do you work around that in uh, in these interviews um, uh, by not only wh what don't they offer, because you know it's kind of a dead end, right? But what what do they offer that if I, you know, if I probe, I might. I might be able to figure something out uh, through, through sort of an indirection. So it is, it is a challenge. It's definitely, you know, the, the interviewers are not, uh, they're not trained folklorists, they're not trained ethnographers. And the project is a very interesting decision, which, you know, has, I'd say, its pluses and its minuses. They wanted to do this fast. You know, their sense was it's 1994, the average age of survivors are in their. 70s, uh, they're not getting any younger. We've got to we've got to do this quickly, and they wanted to do a lot quickly, right? So they trained a, very quickly, a lot of people deliberately of different backgrounds, which is not like a lot of other projects of interviewing Holocaust survivors, where all the interviewers say are trained therapists, right? Or psych psychoanalysts. You know, so for example, Yale has a much more narrow, rigorous uh, approach to who does the interviewing, uh, not only to training, but, but methodology. And here, they were looking for volunteers. And that has, obviously, you know, it's, it's a mass operation, so you get a lot. You don't get consistency. There's a lot of lost opportunities. What you do get that's really interesting is that this is, the whole thing becomes a kind of folk practice. And it reminded me of when, you know, uh, Yivo would, you know, ha would say, um, what, what's this pamphlet, what's this assigned Yiddish ethnographia, right, you know? And they say, you know, you too can be an ethnographer. You can go out into the field and collect stuff and, you know, send it to us. And it's a similar kind of um, practice. And one of the things you learn is, what are the interviewers' sense of the possible? What is their knowledge base? What don't they get? Which in and of itself is, is informative. Um, and so it's, uh, it's not how you would set up the project. It might not be how I would set up the project. But it is the project and, and part of the challenge is, so what can, what can you get out of it? And that actually, once, once I sort of 
had to turn my thinking around because I, I, I struggled with this too, was um, you know, the interviewers are of interest too. And the, the interviewer-interviewee relationship is, uh, uh, is actually quite complex and varies enormously from, from one recording to another. So th thank you for asking that because it's a really, it raises a lot of important issues about working with this material. Point of, sheer, <laughs> point of sheer curiosity about the purity of the language. And the reason I ask this uh -huh. is all of us in this room are English speakers. The difference between English and Yiddish is so extreme that there's not going to be a confusion of words. Almost by definition, a large proportion of the Holocaust survivors grew up speaking German as a primary language. And the similarities in vocabulary, not in the sound, one is a sing-songy language, one is not, of course, but in terms of vocabulary, and the similarities between German and Yiddish are so great that I've often wondered whether some of the interviews that are done in Yiddish, whether they are pure Yiddish or whether some German falls in, whether anybody has ever done a linguistic study of the Yiddish spoken by people whose primary language is German. I don't have to keep going. You know what I'm asking. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll, uh, so the, you know, a question about you know what can you learn about from the language? And there's a couple of things. I mean, one is, um, uh, um, you know, I don't think there's a pure English or Yiddish or anything. I think you know languages are by their nature impure. That's what makes them interesting. And uh, one of the things you can learn just by listening to language use in, um, uh, there's actually a number of things that these offer. First of all, there's a wide range of different dialects. So, you know, people who are, uh, you know, want to hear in conversation, uh, you know, real Litvish Yiddish, real Ukrainish Yiddish, real, you know, Polish Yiddish, you know, Tatar Mamalash, I mean, you name it. it, because they covered, they worked actually very hard to interview people, not only from, Eastern Europe, but people who still were in Eastern Europe, which really uh, had not been done in, in all these you know, Holocaust interviewing projects uh, 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 really m much before. They also worked very hard to interview people in the Haredi community, the ultra-Orthodox community, uh, both Hasidish and, and, and you know, yeshivish. And um, so you get uh, uh, there, um, you know, also a, a whole different set of linguistic issues. And, um, you know, on the question of, you know, language purity on this issue, um, uh, there's, there's one interview in particular that uh, I was struck by that um, says at the beginning, this interview is going to be in English, right? The woman who's being interviewed is Hasidah. She lives in, in Brooklyn. And she starts speaking English. She slides into Yiddish. The interviewer who knows Yiddish, you know, very politely tries to keep encouraging her by asking questions in English and translating and how would you say that in English? She keeps sliding into Yiddish. And at one point he says, she starts a story in Yiddish and he says, uh, uh, of English, of English, you know, in, in English, in English. She says, okay, English. Sie ist gewesen sehr an eleganter Freu, a divorced lady. And you know, she, got, she keeps going back and forth. And you know, I talked to uh, my a friend and colleague, Ayala Fader, who studies contemporary uh, 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 Hasidic Yiddish in, in, in New York, uh, and I, as she said, you know, um, Hasidim will, will tell you that sometimes they don't know what language they're speaking. Uh, and it's not a matter of ignorance, it's a matter of the, the, the category of language that um, uh, 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 certainly academics might get very strict about um, is, is just not operable there. Uh, it, 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 it's not really relevant to speech practices the way it might concern us. Um, and just one thing with regard to the German and Yiddish, there, it's very interesting to hear um, uh, people who were German Jews, uh, who were survivors, uh, talking about encountering Yiddish for the first time uh, in you know, concentration camps or ghettos or wherever they wound up during the war. Uh, and for some of them, uh, this was fascinating, and they set out to learn Yiddish because it's not automatic. Uh, it's, it's, you know, 
there's, there's overlap, but there's, there are, you know, you can't just walk in, start speaking Yiddish if you're a German speaker, and vice versa. Um, there are others who uh, just turned up their noses, refused to speak uh, in Yiddish to Yiddish-speaking Jews, and, you know, one man says, I considered it no language. So, you know, it was very interesting to hear this, this uh, you know, the language wars, you know, in the middle of, in the middle of uh, you know, mass murder, the language wars were, were holding up. It's really, it's really quite striking. So there's a lot actually to learn in these interviews what people say about language um, and what, what language meant before, during, and after the war that, that, that's really richly informative. So it's like another talk. Uh, a question about the impact of uh, time duration. It's 50 years after World War II when these interviews are conducted. Um, and what we have seen today uh, is sort of altered by time. People remembering. Uh, in your search through the archives, and listening to all these tapes, have you found some people that responded more emotionally and conveyed the uh, great tragedy that occurred during their childhood and somehow conveyed that in the conversation? Oh, absolutely. And um, what, what is striking to me is that, that um, that's something that uh, one does hear a lot of, and it is also kind of what one, one expects to hear is about, uh, you know, and it's very interesting how people characterize their sense of, of, of loss, which, you know, is hard for us to wrap our heads around. It's loss of family, of friends, of communities, of languages, of cultures, of way of life, and it, it, it's quite extensive. And, and a lot of people talk about that, not necessarily all in the same way, and because each one of these people, they're very different, I mean, just these six people, they're real different from one another. Um, the, the way they talk about it varies considerably and has a lot to do with how they've processed it, as you've mentioned, over a half century. And that's, that's a key thing to think about watching here, uh, these recordings, is that um, what you're seeing is a product of looking back over a half century of post-war life, which, which frames um, everything that you're, you're, you're seeing and hearing in these interviews. Sometimes that is more readily evident than other times, but, it's, but it is always there, that this is a matter of, of looking back. So, and it's actually, it, it's quite uh, informative to see how differently people remember. That's maybe one of the things that interests me most, even more than what they remember, is, is how they remember, what words they use, what feeling is behind it, what expressive choices they make, um, what, uh, what they draw on to convey to an interviewer who is almost always younger than them, who is, in most cases, somebody they've never met before, talked to on the telephone before briefly to have like a little pre-interview conversation and, um, and to do this one big recollection. It's a one, it's a one off, it's, 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 it's one interview. There are other people who say you really want to understand somebody's life story, you can't do it in one visit. You need multiple visits. I have a, a, a colleague, uh, uh, Hank Greenspan, he says, I've been, I've, been, I've been interviewing the same survivor for over 25 years. And, and I'm not done. So, uh, you know, this is, all of these factors shape, shape what you, you know, how, how the memory takes shape. And so thinking about the time distance is, is uh, it's a really good thing to think about with everything you're, you're watching and listening to. Jeff, you spoke about how the volunteer interviewers were, if not prepped, some of their expectations and the variability in terms of their training and approach. I'm curious from what you're saying about the people who were interviewed. Were they given a written summary of what they'd be asked? Were they prepped in some ways other than with that phone call? Mm -hmm. What were their sense of expectations in going into this and how 
uniform might they be? Okay, that's a very good question. So uh, the interviewers um, did get a sort of, you know, uh, an intensive training program and also their interviews were observed and they got feedback so then and, you know if somebody wasn't a really good interviewer they wouldn't assign them again and if they thought somebody was good they keep using them if they thought somebody needed feedback they would give them feedback on you know different ways of of of, of doing interviews so there's a there is um, you know with this wide range of interviewers there's a lot of training for the interviewees uh, to address your question uh, when they would contact the, the Shaw Foundation, they were asked to fill out first a form to sort of identify, you know, what, what was their, the, the basic story. Because they not only interviewed Jewish Holocaust survivors, they also interviewed other survivors, they also interviewed other witnesses to the Holocaust, like uh, uh, liberators and rescuers and uh, people who, who uh, participated in war crimes trials. So everybody's you know, profile they wanted to have, and they wanted a basic sense of what was somebody's wartime experience, because as you know, there are people who uh, uh, go to camps, there are people who go into hiding, there are people who are going to resistance, there are people who escape going very far east, there are people who you know, escape going very far west, you know, there's a lot of different uh, uh, possibilities. And the, before the interview proper, the recorded interview, the, um, the interviewer uh, contacted the interviewee on the telephone and went through a, a, a pre-interview questionnaire that uh, was to gather basic information, basic biographical information uh, with a special concentration on wartime experiences. And that was done a few days in advance in part so that the interviewer was supposed to go and do some homework about, you know, you know, what do I know about this particular kind of experience or place or background so that they should come in uh, uh, informed. Uh, there were certain expected questions at the beginning, at the end, at the beginning, basic, um, you know, biographical information. What's your name? How do you spell it? Where were you born? When were you born? What were the names of your parents, uh, your brothers and sisters? You know, so they would do this kind of, you know, sort of very quick, like basic genealogical information, and then start asking questions organized in, in chronological order about childhood, uh, working up to then the war years, post-war years, um, and then there were con sort of general concluding questions um, uh, you know, do you have any message for the future? Do you have any final thoughts? Do you have, you know, sort of wrap up kind of questions? However, that's the outline. And in between, you know, each one of these interviews proceeds differently. Um, uh, the, though there's a desire to have things go chronologically, uh, memory jumps around, survivors jumped around, some interviewers would try to like get them back into, wait, 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 don't go there yet because we're not, we're not finished with the 1930s, don't go into the 1940s yet. And some of them would just go where the survivor went. Uh, there are occasional survivors who just will tell you that they're not gonna talk about something. Um, there's one, is a, uh, one uh, uh, woman whose interview I was looking at. Uh, the interviewer said, so tell me about you know, your childhood. And she says, I'm not gonna talk about anything before the war. We'll start in 1939, and they did. And one of the things you learn, or that you, you, you know, so like, why doesn't she want to go there? So my guess, because we don't know for sure, uh, is that she had converted to Christianity before the war. Uh, that did not stop her from being sent to a death camp. Um, uh, and she remains a Christian to this day. And if I had to guess, my guess is that converting to Christianity before the war was a fraught issue with her family and her friends. I think that's a, you know, it's just a guess, but I, I, I think it's an educated guess. And it's not something she wanted to talk about. So you get, um, you get this very interesting kind of push and pull on the part of both the interviewee and the interviewer in relationship to some normative interviewing ideal protocol, and that's when it gets interesting for me, is when, when they start breaking the rules and improvising and moving things around and resisting, uh, uh, because then, um, th then we get a real sense of who these people are and how they're engaging with one another uh, and making this project their own. Um, 
I mean, one of the things that, that I always try to remember is that the survivors go in knowing that they are not the only person being interviewed, that they are part of a mass project. And that's got to be in the back of their minds, that they are contributing to something much larger. At the same time, uh, this is about themselves. And uh, how they want to tell their story is, um, is at the center. And some people are very, they have a very clear sense of how they want to tell their story. Other people are really waiting for the interviewers to lead them along. So there's a lot to do with the personalities involved on both ends. So, um, so there is a design, uh, but the design gets, um, get, gets violated in, in, I think, enriching ways. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can really answer this, but you, know, you showed Bamba, who had talked somewhat before in, in the other film, in the in Shoah about his experiences, um, I've only seen one of these from beginning to end, which is about four hours. Mm -hmm. And the person who I was interested in hearing was very young during the Holocaust, and he also knew my relatives. He was from the town where my grandfather's had grandfather had come from. So it turned out by watching it, all of a sudden he mentions my great uncle's name, who was his cheder teacher, and he does at some point sing a, song, a Yiddish song he sang in the class. But what was interesting to me is that I knew that after uh, this interview, he, that was the first time he ever talked about his experiences. And I was curious if any way you might know, in terms of the other inter people interviewed, if it was the first time they really had talked about it. And in this case, he used that opportunity for the rest of his life to go around speaking about mm -hmm. his experiences. So there's many other uh, videos of him speaking, but not as long as the, this interview. So it's a really good question. And some people will say, I've never done this before. This is the first time I'm telling my story. They might say why, they might not. Um, some people, and actually these are the ones I'm more interested in, um, are the people who have been telling their story a lot. Uh, because I'm curious in, in how the storytelling changes over time, or not. Um, there are uh, some people, not a lot, but there's some people in the archive who have made uh, careers, not necessarily you know, financially, but in terms of their post-war life's work has been telling their life stories. And they are in films, and they have done audio recordings, they're in this archive, they're in that archive, they've written books, and you can look over, you know, in some cases like a, a, a 40 or more year period of different versions of how they tell their life story. And what I find interesting is by the time they're doing this interview 50 years out, part of their life story becomes telling their life story. That they say, um, I, you know, I uh, wrote a memoir, and then I started speaking in schools, and then I was interviewed for this film, and, you know, and, that, and, and, and why it's important, and uh, that there's a kind of you know, recursive act of storytelling becomes uh, a, a fixture of their post-war lives, and, and, and it's, to me, that's especially interesting uh, to think about in relation to these people who, who are the first-time interviews. In some cases, we don't know. Um, there are uh, uh, efforts to create databases compare, you know, comparing the lists of the different archives, because there are, there are dozens of archives, none as big as the one I'm talking about tonight, but some of them quite extensive. Uh, that are around the world, and to, to be able to compare where you find uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, interviews, including people who were recorded in audio on uh, this very famous uh, uh, audio recordings made in, in 1946 by David Boder, who went to DP camps to record uh, about 100 interviews with Holocaust survivors, which is our, our first audio documentation. And some of those folks lived long enough to be uh, recorded in some of these other archives. And the study of this is now becoming an area of interest for people who work on this material. Are we? Sure, we have, if, if you have time, I have time. Unless we.
Okay, this is just a quick question, but one thing um, I was noticing, what do you feel like, maybe you positing maybe these performances is sort of being performances of resistance in a way, I, I, I'm not sure, but like when you get to hear the, the difference between sort of the poems in Yiddish versus the poems in English, what about how poetics enters the conversation? Because in Yiddish, clearly, like there's the direct rhyme scheme and there's rhyme that kind of loses it when we hear it in English, right? So I was just thinking about sort of nostalgia and how poetics might inform the recountings or the narratives. Uh, you know, um, th that's a really good question. I'm not sure if I can give a short answer, but I would say that um, it, th there's actually a, a considerable diversity of uh, you know, ideas about writing poetry that you hear even in just uh, the little bit of samples we've heard. There's only one poem that's written in, in like the rhyming couplets, that's Bomba's poem. Uh, and so like um, Doba Avalovich, we started with, you know, she grew up in the Bund. She was very much product of this secular Yiddishist socialist in, in, in environment. She was in SCIF, which is the youth movement. And so her commitment to Yiddish was very much shaped by uh, a commitment to uh, a certain kind of Yiddish modernism that informs uh, the, the poem that she wrote, very different from Bamba, who is a real amateur poet, right? And he's writing in couplets because, you know, that's when most people say, I'm going to write a poem in, 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 in English, too. It's like it comes out in these rhyme couplets. And that variety actually is part of, part of what makes this interesting looking at this uh, diversity. So yeah, the poetics at work um, is another, another variable in this material. Thank you very much. <laughs>